Okay, so one type of rocket is the liquid fuel ones. This is like petrol. That's right, and this is kind of the, 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 the default thinking of rockets. As you said, you have petrol, you have any sort of liquid, you combine it with oxygen, which naturally happens on Earth, you get flames out. And lots of rockets are liquid fuel rockets. They have a bunch of liquid of different types stored into there. They slowly release and ignite it, and all of a sudden, you get energy out. There, there's actually different components of a liquid rocket, and it's important to think about it because as we talked about before, this is our only propellant, right? So this is the propellant, whatever we choose. And then this is the oxidizer, which might be liquid oxygen or something else which contains oxygen in its chemical mix. That's right. And this then has to be combined, but you have to combine it and float at the right weight. If you just have these two things come together as one big explosion, well... You get one big explosion. You get one big explosion, you're essentially riding a bomb. I always like to say rockets are controlled explosions, because that's actually what they are, right? Yes. It's a controlled explosion. But that sounds dangerous, but in fact a car is a controlled explosion. That's right. Cars are hundreds of controlled explosions if you're going at a thousand RPM, that's a several that's a thousand explosions per second, and you, you can control explosions. You can, and, and this is actually what's happening at stage three and four. You actually are controlling your, flu your fuel flows into pumps that are saying, all right, go at this rate, and this rate slightly changes over time because you need a lot to get you up early, but then you need maybe less as you're going higher, and then you have to then mix it in the chamber, which is actually then igniting it, actually doing those reactions, and then you get your thrust out. And that's what you want. You want the thrust to get you into space. And the nozzle, basically what you're doing is you're putting the very hot stuff out into the nozzle, and then as it expands, because any hot gas that's expands, right. it has to go somewhere and it goes out, and it's the high speeds that goes out that gives you a reaction force that pushes you back up again. Exactly, and that's that lift, that we are t uh, the, the thrust that we're talking about. We're trying to generate as much thrust here, that outward force to help us go up. And keeping in mind, we're losing weight here, right, as we go, yes. as it's converted to thrust out. So it's not a, just a, we're only getting thrust as we lose weight, we get thrust out, so we're actually gaining that accelerant. And these are big tanks. Yes, these are giant. Uh, so one problem, for example, is that the fluid can bounce around inside these things, especially once it's in zero gravity. That's right. I mean, in, in the fuel tank in your car, you could have an outlet at the bottom, and you can rely on that fuel being at the bottom of your tank, because gravity will push it to the bottom. Whereas here, if it's in zero gravity towards the top, or free fall in orbit, the, what, what happens if all the fuel is sitting as a ball up the top and your pipe's at the bottom? Exactly. And so, also, if it's sloshing backwards and forwards, the whole spacecraft can be shaking and vibrating. That destroyed a lot of early spacecraft. That's right. In fact, you often worry about how fast and how much the, the rocket is rotating. You'll often see videos or pictures of saying, oh, the rocket's starting to have a procession or a session. And that's because it's starting to spin. And as you said, the rocket fuel is sloshing around. So you now have a whole bunch of other forces going on. And in fact, it's even a little bit more subtle than that. As we said, we have our fuel, oxidizer, pumps, and combustion changer. But there's actually a lot of other slightly different forces and pressures that we have to deal with, right, Paul? That's right. And so um, the basic idea is to get a very hot gas here with a very high pressure, which will then expand outwards. And that's and our that's velocity. What, that's what the nozzle is for. Exactly. Now, the, the best way to get this is to have the highest temperature possible. Yep. And that's partially going to need very powerful pumps to be able to pump a lot of fuel very quickly into there. Yep. Um, but of course, you have too much temperature in here, your nozzle is going to melt. Exactly. And what a lot of uh, uh, these nozzles have is the fuel is actually pumped up and down in veins inside the nozzle, which first of all preheats the fuel and also keeps the nozzle cool enough that it doesn't melt. Yep. But even so, you can see when these things take off when they're in tests, so the nozzle is glowing red hot. Oh, yeah, exactly. So you have to build the nozzle out of something very, very strong. If you kept the temperature very low, that would make the nozzle much more durable, but it's also not going to give you anything like the thrust you need. Exactly. So, so and, you, and, you know, for all these little changes that you make, how fast or how slow the fuel goes, that will change, as you said, that temperature, that force, that pressure out. And again, it's not all about as fast as possible. You want to get it at that, you know, they say slow and steady wins the race sometimes and you want to get a good steady rate because if you go fast and then slow this will actually change how much thrust you get and you may not get that critical speed as you want to exit the earth and a big trouble is basically you're maintaining a controlled explosion yep. in here which is exploding at just the rate that fuel comes in but it's very easy for it to become unstable that's right for example a bunch of fuel doesn't explode it all explodes at once possibly blowing your nozzle apart or very giving you such vibration that everything in your spacecraft is shaken to pieces and so trying to keep this as a steady explosion where the fuel comes in at just the right rate it's fully combusted fully mixed and all the right things while all the time you're talking about 
huge amounts of fuel being pumped through massive pumps, and often this is at cryogenic temperatures. That's right. So, uh, so you're going from minus 100 degrees here to plus 1,000 degrees there. So there's a lot of problem. And of, well, of course, when you're on the launch pad, it's not at those temperatures. That's right. So you've got to deal with the fact that it heats up very quickly once you're going up. So it's, it's so difficult. Th it is rocket difficult. Science. It is rocket science. And, I, you know, and again, this is the simplified version. Now, if you can get it to work, there actually are different choices. Now, the default that people like is mixing liquid hydrogen with your liquid oxidizer, in this case, just pure oxygen too. Now, this is the benefit that you get that 120 megajoules per kilogram. So this gives you the most energy per kilogram. That's right. Which is going to allow you to put more payloads into a higher orbit than anything else. Exactly. The drawback is that both the helium and the oxygen have to be cryogenically cooled. That's right. Uh, or put under enormous pressure, um, which means it's going to increase the weight of whatever they're That's stored right. in. Um, you often see when rockets take your ice falling off the outside. That's right, yes. Um, and that's because these things are often cryogenically cooled. That's right. And also the density is pretty low. Exactly. So while there's not much mass, you're going to have to have a very, very large rocket to be able to fit these things in. So this is often used just for the top stages that's of right. your rocket. Um, where Because all the difficulty of handling it, you'd have to pump it in at the last moment. I mean, if you had liquid, liquid helium, liquid oxygen, and you, to power your car, it would be great. But you'd have to load up at the last possible moment because it's going to start boiling off as soon as you release it. Exactly. And in fact, this is often part of the procedures is the fueling up at the last stage of the liquid hydrogen and oxygen is the last bit. But also, if they don't burn it, as you said, sometimes they have to abort it. You can't just leave a whole bunch of hydrogen and oxygen floating around ready to be exploded. You have to pump it all out. Yeah, it's very difficult. You, you, you're just ready to launch. You've got to count down T minus five and then suddenly something goes wrong. Which happens. Then you've got to get rid of all the stuff. You can't just leave it there for more than you know, a day or so. Exactly. Because then, as you said, it will heat up, it will expand, and then you can have other problems. Now, so one in theory, this is the best possible rocket fuel. In practice, a lot of these issues actually make it not so good. That's right. So people look at other different types. So we have liquid oxygen. A popular one is mixing it with liquid methane. Now, we have lots of methane on Earth. Uh, it has the hydrogen and also has the carbon. Um, it has its benefits because some of those temperatures uh, and, and densities are different than liquid hydrogen. This is used a lot in the SpaceX and Blue Origin rockets. With the idea that it's an easy thing to handle. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you could uh, have a more exotic rocket fuel might make your rocket more efficient, but if you need to be wearing protective clothing and uh, you have to also sort of exotic chemical production yeah. facilities on the ground, that cost might well kill your entire process. Exactly. And in fact, in the early stages, people just liked kerosene. Um, the Saturn V, for instance, um, the, the very first stage, which is the big part of the Saturn V rocket, was mixing oxygen, which is kerosene. As I said, it's not as energy efficient as, say, hydrogen and oxygen. A lot easier to handle and deal with, and a lot easier to produce kerosene. People have also looked at alcohol or ethanol. So you get other byproducts, but this was the early stages. So in fact, the very first V2 rockets that were built, or Redstone, mm -hmm. the precursor, were kerosene. Uh, Robert Goddard, who was kind of the first person to li really try the liquid rocket, says, use gasoline. And we, you know, if you know it, it, it burns, and it know it creates a, a reaction, very easy to obtain. As he said, you don't need the special chemicals. You don't get as much energy, which is why these rockets were always smaller and didn't go as higher, but it works. But basically, all of these things, you're basically combining, um, you've got a hydrocarbon. Exactly. So energy is the, the, and the carbon will then combine with the oxygen. That's right. You're, you're giving you CO2, the same reaction that powers your car. That's right. Um, and so basically, anything that stores the carbon with as a few other atoms in there as possible to add to the weight. That's right. So methane, you know, CH4, whatever it might be, these are the, the where you're just adding relatively light amounts of hydrogen to stabilize your carbon. In principle, you could just fire graphite in and combine it with oxygen. But the, the logistics <laughs> of how you do that would be a bit harder. So, so there's lots of different ways to create a liquid rocket fuel. There's lots of different combinations. And he said it depends on safety, it depends on how much. O on Mars, people are looking at how do we use it actually carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide because it's abundant in the atmosphere and we just need that hydrocarbon, as you said, and if you produce more H2O or carbon dioxide on Mars, well, mm. it's already there. So there's lots of different ways to do it, but they will all have their different energies they get out, which will really affect how much we can put into space. The other rocket fuel that you sometimes hear about is the hypergolic 
Yes. Um, these are um, can contain their oxidizer inside them. Exactly. Um, so that means you don't want to smoke near one of these things. No. Uh, so the benefit you can have one system rather than two. It's all already pre-mixed. Which is very simplified. Um, the trouble is they're incredibly toxic and difficult to handle and explosive. Yes. So they tend to be used for manoeuvring rockets to That's maneuver right. in space because it makes it much simpler to build your manoeuvring rockets. You have two separate tanks with which need to be warmed up and two separate sets of pumps, just one. Um, and the, the, the Soviets, the Russians, used yep. them quite a bit for takeoff, but they were dangerous and toxic. So most of the more current rockets don't use these. That's right.